This is Herb Ellis, and I'd like to welcome you to my musical video. Together with the help of Ray Brown and Terry Holmes, I'd like to answer some questions about guitar playing that have been asked me by guitar players all over the world. The first thing that we're going to do is talk about tuning up. Are we going to tune up? I. Uh, I advise using a um, tuner, guitar tuner, especially if you're playing with two guitars, two or three guitars. It's uh, pretty important to use a tuner because no matter how good your ear is, you get three guitars together and uh, tune up without a tuner, uh, you may sound like rats escaping from a sinking ship. So it's, if you can, <laughs> use a tuner. And even though you use a tuner, when you're on stage playing, you're going to have to tune up by yourself. There's no escape from being able to tune the guitar by yourself. So we're going to start by uh, tuning the strings individually. I'll give you my pitch, and I'll hit each string. First the E, and then the A. D and the G and the B and the little E. After you get that, you've got you're in the ballpark. Now to fine tune the guitar, I really recommend this and strongly advise it. Tune the guitar in octaves from here to here. Because even though you get the guitar in tune open strings, it very well may not play in tune all over because the guitars are an imperfect instrument. So you play some octaves. Then you just play octaves all over the guitar. Yeah. 
Sith, but that's okay too. Now that we're in tune, in this segment, I'd like to play some, uh, with the help of Terry Holmes, I'd like to play some blues in the key of G. This is a simple, simple blues with simple chord formation. First I'll play, and then I'll tell you how I do it. Here we go, Terry. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I'm going to show you the way I approached playing that blues that we just played. I play mostly by chord formations, as opposed to thinking of uh, a lot of uh, scales, and uh, it's very confusing to me. So I just play by chord formations. On uh, that blues that we played in G, which was a very simple blues, I mean simple in, in its harmonic structure, I only use two formations, and I'm going to show them to you now. The first one is a G chord, this G chord. Everybody knows this chord. I'll play um, a scale, a major scale from this chord formation. I could play it back up, but that's for you to figure out. Uh, now I'm going to play a chromatic scale from the same chord formation. to play the major scale flatting the F sharp to make it an F, to make it a G7 chord. Now you've got, <coughs> with those two scales and the chromatic scale, You've got every note that you could possibly play from this formation. Now I'm going to show you the other formation that I use in this simple G blues. It's this. First I'll play a chromatic. play two scales from this chord formation. Here's another one.
again, <clears throat> from this formation, with playing the chromatic scale, you, there's no note that you can't play. And when this is the C ninth, C seventh, when you play the D seventh in this blues progression, you just move the whole thing up to D. You got it. And uh, it, it takes all the mystery, a lot of the mystery, out of uh, uh, the way to play the guitar, jazz-wise. A very important thing that I'm going to tell you right now, <clears throat> and I may tell you several times because it is that important to me. When I'm playing, I sing what I play, or I'm playing what I sing. And any guitarist, all the guitarists that I know, that I like, and on other instruments also, sing what they play, or they yeah, play what they sing, whichever way you want it. I can, I'll name some besides myself. Joe Pass, Wes Montgomery did it. Uh, George Benson certainly does it. You can hear him doing it because he, it, it's part of his act to do it. Oscar Peterson does it. Ray Brown and a lot of horn players. You can't tell that horn players are doing it because they got the horn in their mouth. But that's the one single thing I want to impress on you. You've got to start singing the melodies you're playing. That way, you're using the guitar to express the music that's in you, in your head and in your heart. Otherwise, you're just playing a bunch of learned scales and patterns. And you may get to where you can play a lot of patterns and play them very fast, but it'll always sound like you're playing a lot of patterns. So please start to play the music that's within you, and we all have music within us. I'm just trying to show you how to turn the faucet on, the musical faucet. That's good, isn't it? The musical faucet to let the music come out. Now I'm going to show you, with the help of Terry Holmes, what you can play or what you can do with this one chord formation. Actually, this G formation is, I'm thinking of it as a G seventh. So you hear this in your mind, you hear the G seventh. You might hear the flatted fifth. So you play it in your scale or just play the flatted fifth. Or you might hear the augmented fifth. Or you might hear the ninth. Or you might hear the flat at night. All those are right there for you to play. So I'm going to uh, play a vamp, an extended vamp, on this G chord. And I'm going to try to start simple and get more complex as I go along. Also, remember this. We're playing it in G. That doesn't mean that you can only play this in G. It means you can play it anywhere on the neck. Anywhere that this chord formation is, you can play it. So, here we go. G, one, two, one, two, three.
Now we're going to play on the C ninth formation. And uh, I'm just gonna play, Terry's gonna vamp and I'm gonna play extended on this C ninth formation. Trying to start simple and getting more complicated. I'm not going to do this on the D ninth because it's the same thing. All you have to do is move it up two frets. So here we go on C ninth. One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> to involve you, the listener and viewer, for the first time. We're going to play G7, and we're just going to continue to play it in four-bar segments. I'm going to play four bars, with Terry's going to vamp, he's going to continue to vamp, and then you'll play four, then I'll play four. It's like we're trading fours, but it's all on the G uh, formation. So this will show you not only how to play on this formation, It'll give you, hopefully, some incentive to uh, play a better four bars than I have just played. One, two, uh, one, two, three. Now we're going to do the same thing in the C formation. No, I'm wrong. It's the next four bars of the blues, which will be two bars of C ninth and two bars of G ninth, or C seventh and G seventh. Here we go. Terry, one, 
two. One, two, three. <laughs> So, you can do the same thing in on the D7, D9 formation. Now, we're going to put it all together one more time and play the whole blues for you a few times, three or four times. And uh, we hope that you get a lot from this. One, two, uh, one, two, three, four. play some more blues for you. A lot of this cause musical video will be blues because I believe that blues is the best possible way to teach you to play jazz. Uh, if you can't play blues, uh, any of the rest of the jazz you would attempt to play, in my opinion, would be quite meaningless. So, this blues is a little more elaborate than the first blues we showed you. The first blues was very simple harmonic structure. This has some different chords, so we're going to play it three or four courses, then we're going to show you what we're doing that's different. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs>
Okay, I'm going to uh, play this blues for you, the uh, chord formation of this blues, the progression. It's a little different because it's got a couple of new chords in it that we, we didn't play on the first blues. So here it is, bar one, G13, bar two, C9, bar three and four, G7 or G13 again. Bar five and six, C ninth. Bar seven, G ninth. Bar eight, E, E seventh, E ninth. That's the new chord. Here's another introduction. A seventh, and then D seventh. Bar eleven, two beats each, G. Bar 12, A, and D. I'm going to show you a new chord formation that we haven't played from before. We're still in the key of G, which just sort of simplifies the whole thing, but as I said before, it doesn't mean it won't work in any key. It'll work in any key. Before I was playing the G formation here, now, I've moved it up to here, to the seventh fret. And you combine this one with the one you already knew, the G ninth, which is the same as the C ninth or the D ninth. It's just up higher on the neck. And the... Uh, Sixth, no, the seventh and the eighth bar in this progression is a little different. Here is the difference. It goes from a G 13th to an E 13th, or a G 7th to an E 7th. So it would, if you're gonna play those two bars, let me just play those two bars for you. The thing is, which gives it the real flavor, is when you go to the um, E chord, you don't have to play the third, but if you play it, if you employ it once in a while, it really, it really sparkles. It makes, it makes the chord just stand out, which is what's different about this progression. So. So, I think we're going to play that blues progression, the whole thing, two more times for you. Terry, here we go. This is the whole 12 bars. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> I'd like to talk just a little bit about the progression two, five, one. We're gonna play four bars. I'm gonna play four bars. Terry's gonna come to me. Then he's going to play four more bars where I don't play. That's your time to play. The first progression is gonna be two, five, one with a minor. A minor seventh, one bar. D seventh, one bar. G seventh, two bars. Then, a, then again, the same thing. A minor seven, the bar, D seven, G seven, two bars. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs>
Now we're going to do almost the same thing, except that the two chord, instead of being A minor seven, is going to be A seventh. So it'll be a bar of A seventh, a bar of D seventh, two bars of G seventh. Uh, we all have favorite things in music. I personally like the A seventh sound better than I do the A minor to D seventh, although uh, I can live with either one. But uh, the difference is, making the C a C sharp. So if you're playing A minor seventh, here would be the scale. And the arpeggio. Now that's the A minor, A minor seventh. The A seventh is as opposed to this one. When you're playing the A minor seventh, you can go up to a C major seventh and play a scale right off of the C major seventh. A seventh or A minor seventh. Now we've played the A minor progression for you, so now we're going to play the A seventh, D seventh, G seventh for two bars. It's a four bar progression. Here we go. I'm going to play four. You're going to play four. One, two, a one, two, three. Now we're going to add the ever popular magic E7, or the sixth chord. And this progression is going to start on the two chord. I'm going to use A7, D7, G7, E7. And I'm going to play them over and over again. I'm going to play four bars. You're going to play four bars. And let me just reiterate to you one more time. Not always, but a lot of the times when I'm going from the G to the E, I will use this, this, this formation. For the G and for the E, I go. That's very important to get the third of the, get the G sharp in there. You might want to practice this little scale a while. So the two going from the G to the E would sound like this. And then the A. To the D seventh. Which is same thing as the E seventh. Now this is sort of a complicated progression. So we're going to play it a little slower for you. Okay, here I'll play the first four, and you got the second four. One, two, one, two, three, four. Thank you. 
let's talk about picking. Picking is sort of like putting in golf. It's very individual. It's individual in the stroke that you use. It's individual in the kind of pick that you choose. I, cho I have a hard pick, and it's about the size of a quarter. I place it between the first finger and the thumb. Very natural. And I, most of it is in the meat of my hand, between the thumb and the, and the forefinger. About a fourth of it sticks out, I guess. And uh, I play not totally flat. I play across the string at an angle but at a natural angle, just like you were gonna hammer a nail at a very natural angle. I see players play like this. Now, I said it's an individual thing, but I w if you play like that and you can change it, I would strongly advise it because I think you're gonna have trouble later on, I'm serious. I think you're gonna get some arthritic problems playing like that because I don't care who you see do it or how hip it looks, it's a big strain on the hand, and it's a strain on all the muscles. So if, if you can play in a normal fashion. The only thing I can tell you about picking, or something else I can tell you is, you don't have to pick every note. That's a real blessing. Because if I had to pick every note, uh, I'd never be able to do it, especially at a fast tempo. What I mean by that is you... I'm not picking all of those. Some of them I'm picking, some of them not. Some of them I'm not picking. I ghost some of the notes. And that helps. Not only does it take the strain off of you, it sounds better because you don't hear a trumpet player or a saxophone player tonguing every note. They don't go tucka, 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 tucka. They, they, they make it flow. So um, pick in a nice, and don't grip the pick too hard. Just firm, but not so much to cut the circulation off. I can show you a couple of exercises that might help you. And another thing, while I'm thinking of it, don't have big strokes, make the strokes small. Economy is the thing in picking. You don't want a lot of motion. Uh, now, some exercises, you can take a, you can take a scales. And I would suggest that you play the scale or a pattern, anything you want. First of all, play it all down. so forth. Then play it all up. Then play it up and down. That was down and up. Then play it up and down. Now you've got every possible way to pick. Down, all down, all up. Down, up, up, down. Then you vary your patterns with leaving a string between, like playing from the sixth string to the fourth string, the fourth string to the second string, and so forth. And you, the, the fun thing is you can make up your own uh, phrases or your own licks to practice by. And as far as talking about practicing, let me just say one thing. When you practice, if you're gonna practice reading or picking or whatever, do that first because if you pick up the guitar and start to play some blues and jam and freak out, you'll never get to the other things, never. So you wanna do the things that are maybe even distasteful to you. Do them first, then get to the fun part. And uh, you'll make a lot of progress that way.
Let's talk about background. It's very important to learn how to play backgrounds for your fellow players. That includes, as I played background for Ray Brown earlier in this video cassette, the same type of backgrounds I played for him basically would be the same I'd play for a piano player or a saxophone player or a trumpet player or a trombone player or perhaps another guitar player. One type of background that's really overlooked these days is playing rhythm. A lot of players don't have any idea how to play rhythm. First of all, they play, many guitarists play it too loud. If you're playing it on electric guitar, don't have much volume on. Keep the volume very low and keep the chord, chords that you play very simple and sparse. I usually play three notes in these chords on three strings, sometimes on two strings. Rarely do I play four strings, never five and never ever six in playing rhythm. Unless I'm playing a ballad and I want a lush background, but that's different for now. I'm, so I will show you what I played behind Ray Brown earlier, rhythm wise. This is basically what it is. Now let me show you the type of chord forms that I use to play that rhythm background. They're bas basically three note chords, sometimes two. For instance, if I was playing a G7th, it would be this, or this, or I might play this, it has no seventh in it, but you don't need it. You don't need the seventh with the, uh, with the solos, but playing behind the solos. And if I'm playing a sixth chord, a C6, instead of, play, instead of playing, I would play. And then for a diminished chord, I would play not this, or not this. Just three notes. So the notes would look, I mean, the chord formations would look. Now, that's the type of uh, rhythm backgrounds I would play. And I, you make the, the uh, stroke, you make the, it, it long. In other words, you don't play short, you don't play. You play.
similar to that. Now, another thing that I do is I comp, similar to a piano player, <clears throat> behind uh, other people who are playing solos. solos. By the way, if you learn to play good backgrounds on the guitar, you'll work a lot more than if you just play great solos and no backgrounds. Because unless it's your group, people will want you to play behind them. And they, they love it when you play great solos, but let's face it, they don't care as long as they're playing great solos, but when they play, they want you to play well behind them. So that's very important. Now let's take approximately the same tempo, and I'll show you how I would comp. Sometimes it's two notes, sometimes three, sometimes four. Key of G, blues, one, two, blues in G. By the way, <clears throat> that was on the second blues pr progression we played, the one that went to the E7 and to the A7 and D7. So uh, that's about it. Uh, if I'm playing background for a ballad, I would make it more lush. There's a chance to use. There's a chance for you to use bigger chords and more or less lush voicings uh, playing a ballad because there, you don't confuse any things. Remember two things. When you're soloing, sing what you play. When you're playing a background, play less than you need to play. All right, we're going to talk about sound at this point. First of all, let me tell you the kind of equipment that I use. My guitar is a Gibson ES-175. It's quite old. It's a 1953. Uh, I've had the pickup changed in it, uh, a newer type pickup. Sometimes pickups will lose their power after a few years, so if, if you're having a lot of trouble with, uh, with the guitar humming or roaring or feeding back, you might consider putting a, a new pickup in it. And while I'm at this, let me just take time out to say one thing to you about your pickup. If you have a pickup that has the screws or the, under each string, they're there for a reason. They're there to be adjusted. I'd say 95% of the guitar players never touch those screws in the pickups. I don't know why. I don't know why they think they're there. They're there to be raised and lowered. It is my opinion, and it makes the guitar easy for me to play, if I can get the strings to have approximately the same volume. Here's the way you do that. You take the, the screw under the little E string and raise it as high as it'll go without it rattling. You don't want it to rattle against the string. Then, you turn your amplifier on and you hit the B string and it will be probably much louder than the E string. So you take a screwdriver and screw it down till you can get it to as near the same volume as the E string. Then you do that with the rest of the string. You screw them up or down as they need it, as much as they need it, so that they'll be Now I use 
a polytone amplifier, a smaller model. There's several models. And uh, the way I set mine is I set the bass control on the amplifier approximately at three. I set the treble at about seven. If it has a mid-range, I set that right in the center, usually. Each place you play will vary. You may have to vary the settings on it. And then once I get that set, then I, uh, I get the tone, bassy, more bass or more treble from the guitar. I like a little darker, uh, bassier sound, but you may like a different sound. Whatever sound you want, that's what the dials are for. But they mean a lot, and it means a lot to set your amplifier and, uh, and to uh, adjust the screws on your guitar. Believe me, it means a lot. So take time out and, and do it right. One of the questions I'm asked is, who are my musical influences? And jazz-wise, I would have to say first, the great guitarist Charlie Christian, who played with Benny Goodman, with the Benny Goodman Sextet and the Benny Goodman Orchestra in the late 30s and early 40s. And Charlie Christian died when he was 23 years old. And he is the most copied jazz guitarist of anybody. He was a big influence. Then uh, Le uh, Lester Young with the Count Basie Orchestra was a very heavy influence on me. The whole Count Basie band, the sound of the Count Basie band was a big influence, as was the Jimmy Lunsford band. So it would be Charlie Christian, Lester Young, Charlie Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie. Those would be my main influences. Of course, I heard and I loved and was influenced some by Django Reinhardt. But those gentlemen were the strongest influences on me. I'm also asked a lot what I consider the main ingredients of jazz music. And for me, in this order, they are rhythm, but what I mean by that is rhythmical playing playing with rhythm, playing with time, playing that so that it makes you feel good, the melodic content and the harmonic content, and the technique to do all that with. But I certainly place the rhythmic feel first, then the melody, then the harmony. I hear a lot of players who seem to put harmony first, and uh, the rhythmic content last, if at all, and a great influence, or, or not influence, but a great emphasis on how many notes can be played. That's the backwards order as far as I'm concerned. I'm also asked, where do you go from here, Herb? Which I, <laughs> which I find when I'm on the road is quite humorous. Who cares where I go from here? So uh, I can't answer that. From here, I'm going home. Thank you. 
Thank you.